Yeah, so before uh, we start, uh, a short disclaimer about this uh, presentation. Uh, so this one is not really uh, technical by any means. And uh, there, there will be no a single code example or advocating for some specific library that allows you to write in micro front end style. So uh, yeah, and I don't, I don't want to waste time for people who really wanted some technical uh, perspective on it. So just calling it out early. And this talk is more about what uh, micro front ends are and when you might want to use them. Just these two among all of the possible questions around this one. All right, so let's start. Oops. Hey, um, yeah, so my name is Ed. Um, I'm working as a software developer for quite some time. And uh, I think, so I've tried different things uh, before that, and uh, I sort of decided to go full web around uh, five years ago. And I'm still learning. It's not like I mastered anything uh, during this period. So right now I'm working on the project uh, from the education uh, field. And we are writing software for elementary and middle schools for uh, United States. And the company that uh, we are uh, we are helping out uh, to write the software is on the market for quite some time. Uh, so they have a long history and uh, lots of ups and downs, which I will cover later. So that's how it looks today. All right, so what this project, how this project looks as of now. Um, so this is software for schools and is delivered in the form of uh, a set of websites for both teachers and students. And uh, it wasn't always the case to aim for online learning. And uh, it was sort of on the back burner for uh, quite a while, but with COVID and all of the changes all over the world, it now became a full, uh, like the main goal of this project to support as much tooling for online um, learners as possible. Um, and it's not the only one that company uh, actually develops, but that's the current one I'm working on. So it's, it really originated not that long ago, around uh, 2018. And the way we work, we have uh, four uh, front-end teams working in the same space and a couple more teams that support us with uh, back-end work and some infrastructure work. And for these last three years, we accumulated um, a multi-stack state for this work. So we have React uh, of different versions before hooks and with hooks now. We have some sites written in AngularJS and uh, some are uh, basically in Angular, like in a newer version. And there is no, um, there are no profiles and engineers. So usually you would write everything that that's on a plate. So it could be both front end and back end work. Um, yeah, I want to mention the team composition as it's sort of uh, important for this topic. Um, so the way we work, we have um, single web. Uh, so basically we have a set of websites, right? And each website support multiple domains. So for the school software, it's easy. And as you can think about them as subjects. So math is really different from science or English. So, uh, and we build our teams around this idea. So one thing is there could be a math team that only cares about writing support for math lessons or assessments. And the science team will only care about their lessons for science. And we never really interact or overlap in, at least in, in content for this. But it's also possible that some features um, make sense in all domains. Like um, when you have some handy uh, UI enhancement that your product owner asks you to add, 
uh, most of the time we would double check if it makes sense to to build it in a way it supports everyone as we're working in the same repo in the same space so we're sort of building this feature for all and then presenting it to other teams saying hey we build it for our domain but it's sort of generic so you can make use of it if you want to yeah and on top of that uh, as there is a single repo for for four teams one team acts as an as an owner for this so it sort of impacts the way we do code reviews so once you have your work done and uh, your team signs off it's ready to go you usually wait for the owner team to review it double check and then sorry merge and release it for you so there is like some slight inefficiency there that sometimes you would have to wait for complete work to sit there and get to release so it's out of our control to release it to production um yep um, yeah so honorable mention to react on this slide um so as i mentioned the company has quite a history and it was bought out a couple of times by different vendors then like went bankrupt was bought out back by founders relaunched so it went uh, through multiple cycles of reorganization and uh, restarting the business um, and the impact of this is that we accumulated a lot of um, different uh, technology stacks as there were different teams um, rewriting same software in a technology that was standard for for this company or we would just start from scratch and pick up anything that was hot for this period uh, so there was quite a mix of everything at some point and uh, it wasn't really great so company decided that we need to standardize both backend and front end tool and the choice was made to use react for any new front end work as we go forward um yeah but in reality um I, it it couldn't really happen that all of the software magically convert to react uh, in one day so what what we do today we are definitely starting new projects with react and um, there is some sort of artificial rule we are writing new components for existing sites in react too but we also are maintaining the old websites in angular as we need to tweak or update them so it's sort of a mix of technologies that we have and the delivery expectation is still the same despite this mix you would have to deliver as fast as we used to um yeah um so this having this limitation of one framework to be your default choice for any future work uh, led us to try out uh, different mixes of uh, frameworks within a single app which might look like micro front ends and i just have a couple of examples what we did prior to that um, so the first case um, uh, for one of the websites we've implemented um, a class level dashboard so it was really to write a data summary of some class level data for a list of students so it was developed in react and then uh, integrated with the java web app with the server side rendering and the front end for it was built with jquery and there was uh, no um, basically it wasn't really a fully client-side application. So once you click on the link to get somewhere, you would go through a full page refresh. So for this project, we were lucky enough to, uh, to get all of the data from the main app and just pass it via props on the rendering step uh, for this React view, uh, which worked for this case. And the main motivation here from developers was to showcase product team that we work faster with react and uh, let's just rewrite the whole uh, this whole uh, website in react at some point so it was the first step the second case was more complex um, 
uh, we had all the application written in backbone it was and it was like a really key uh, part of the ecosystem and we also had this limitation of that wouldn't allow us to add new features there in backbone anymore so for this project we built a new standalone web application in react and it was hosted separately so it was like a full featured website and um, the old application would still be the main entry point for the user, but when you reach to the certain point in the app and click to open the next view, you would be, so they would share the same domain. Uh, so in reality, you would get transferred to a different website, but as we mimicked the UI, it felt that you are still in the same application. Um, yeah, so at this point, you can clearly see how both apps uh, were not really complementing each other, and uh, each one was a flawed in the other one from memory. So it was completely destroyed, and then when we're, we're, you're going back, it was reloaded once again. Uh, and the way it worked, we were lucky enough to mm, to get away with this approach. Uh, so basically the first app was caching everything in the browser storage. So we've just updated our new app to, to how to read data from there. And going back to the old app uh, was pretty fast as there were no network requests happening. It would just read from the browser. So there was definitely a delay for the user, but it was dramatic. Um, and the motivation here was actually that uh, having this uh, in place will allow us at some point to switch all customers to, in, to the new website. So instead of rewriting old app, we would just incrementally update the new one and then switch over a URL one day. The last case, it's more trivial. So there is an existing uh, AngularJS website and um, starting since some date we are just writing all of the new components there in react and uh, they are compiled with the main source and we are bridging we are react to angle library that works pretty fine for for this case and um, yeah we get all of the data from the parent app and the idea here uh, that AngularJS is now considered to be like an obsolete despite being an active application. So we cannot really write new functionality with it anymore. And uh, the plan there is to just write the whole app in React at some point. All right, so, um, so having these three, uh, at least for us internally, we were thinking that we already step uh, into the land of micro as we were doing some small uh, updates to the app. We had the technology mix. Sometimes we had uh, them deployed separately. So it definitely felt like uh, we are doing this thing already. Um, so it turned out to be not the case. And um, on our roadmap for next year, we have two items to adopt. The first one is actually to support microfinance architecture to help us with um, a code review process that I mentioned where you have to wait on somebody to, uh, to approve your work. And I also mentioned in monorepo pattern as at least the team thinks it could be complementary to microfinance architecture, but it's definitely not a must, must there. All right, so let's touch the topic of what a micro front end is um, and why all of the cases I've shared are not really micro front ends. Uh, so just throw in here the quote from, from the, one of the articles on the internet. Uh, so basically micro front end is the ar architectural style where you create independent front end apps and then somehow combine them into the final bigger app that the user is using. Um, so what this means is that it's not really about any specific software or tool or even approach. 
architecture style basically means what rules you define for your system and um, how you split the how you split the components there and how you make them interact with with each other so basically where you draw the line that something has no knowledge about this part and if it needs something from it how you would get this data from um, so we could uh, i would like to highlight four main ideas of micro front so if you are adopting this technique what are the four key uh, four key ideas you are aiming for? Uh, so first of all, you are aiming for bringing to autonomy to your teams. So each team feels pretty independent and it's not really slowed down by any other team in terms of approval or code review or some other dependency. Uh, the second one uh, is that you are investing into creating separate pipelines for all teams to be able to deploy also independently. And this means that uh, if I want to deploy some part of the website uh, earlier than the other team is ready, I have a tool to do so. Uh, this next one, uh, you are not really locking in anyone into some specific technology. So you can see how our company decided to standardize on React. So developers don't really have much choice. If you are embracing microfinance, you are sort of um, uh, trusting your teams to make right choices for you. And the last one is uh, says no shared runtime. So the idea is that uh, once you have those independent teams that deploy separately, you have to limit them and uh, really make them write independent apps and not really reusing or somehow importing or interacting with others, even if they need to. Um, so these are four main ideas there. Um, so taking a step back here, uh, some of the sources, when you read about micro front ends, uh, some of the sources claim that uh, they take some inspiration from microservices, which sort of counterintuitive as uh, microservices ap uh, approach is mainly suited for backend work, where backend works operates on a different technology as, and has different uh, constraints and limitations. So it was interesting to see that this was an inspiration from for a front-end as well. So I decided in this talk to just to do a quick recap on what we've learned from microservices and uh, to see if the points that are valid in the backend world are still valid in, on the front-end. Um, so microservices uh, definitely is not the new pattern and uh, it was also aimed to solve some problems that were happening in the backend world back in the days. Um, so like a short uh, list of what was sold with microservices. So in case you have a large system and you, you were struggling to update it, um, fast enough or you were struggling just in general with it. Uh, so microservices were helping out just to make it more manageable as you were splitting the system into different components and just building teams around them and um, basically letting those teams only care about some part of the application. So it was less uh, knowledge to, to learn there. Uh, having this split and uh, having separate parts of the application as standalone components would actually speed up your delivery in a way that you're not really waiting for some, sorry, for some other team to be ready if you're sharing repo or is the same app or if somebody just uh, published a bad uh, state as all of them would uh, deploy them independently to production. The other big uh, key factor for this split uh, 
was performance optimization. So on the back end, it was uh, really handy to split systems into separate components as you would just scale up uh, independent part of the applications based on, on the usage pat pattern. And um, so for example, you could uh, have lots of read operations uh, and less writes or vice versa. So then having this as a separate services would allow you to scale them differently. And this also allows you to pay less money if you're using cloud provider. And stepping into this split also unlocks you with a different technology for each uh, service. And it was really important on the backend as um, the choice of database or the choice of the language for the service could be uh, really beneficial for uh, each uh, exact um, use case. So some services might benefit from in-memory databases. Some services need um, could use key value or uh, databases that scale indefinitely, right? Some services need relational databases if they have complex queries and they can't really use some simpler, uh, simpler ones. So all of this was now uh, unlocked because uh, of this split. Um, so just to summarize and try to connect these two, uh, so you can think about microservices as um, small components that were grouped around uh, business features, uh, which, um, which is important to raise that uh, for microfinance, you, you might think about the split around UI or pages, where the real goal should be uh, around business domain or at least some feature set that is uh, specific and independent enough and it not always translates one to one to the ui um, yeah the independent deploys is the same uh, key concept here and all of the services had to communicate to each other over the network and only through the defined interface so um, you cannot really uh, take shortcuts, even if you know how to get this data faster, you would have to go and uh, download it over the network just for the sake of decoupling this system and to keep everyone independent of each other. And technology uh, agnostic idea was pretty important to basically to support different cases. Um, and a uh, couple of lessons learned from developing microservices. Um, so the first one um, was, wasn't was really enforced in the early days. So when people started uh, decomposing their services into separate uh, several services, uh, not all of the teams actually started uh, splitting databases or moving data around. So this led to a pretty bad state where you, on the top level, you have multiple independent components with a defined interface, but under the hood, all of them have access to the same data store. And uh, what happens um, in practice, uh, for example, I need my team needs a feature from another team from this who owns this service, but they have a tight schedule, so they can't really deliver in time for us. So we'll, what we would do, we would just uh, just be throwing a couple of joints on our queries or writing uh, selects for this data. You would get uh, everything you need uh, out of the database, which felt much faster than when you download it over the network, right? And uh, this led to this intercoupling uh, under the hood which then would just slow you down in case somebody in case we need to change the technology so it wasn't really clear how to change the dat database in this case or uh, once you accumulate more and more data over the years uh, some specific queries would get slower over time and then at some point you would just uh, end up with a super slow query and uh, it might you might be on a tight schedule to fix it, but it would affect lots of teams uh, unexpectedly. 
So the rule of thumb for microservices is that you never really reuse the same database in, in different services. So each service spun up its own store and never expose data otherwise than through the interface. Um, and the second one, so being technology agnostic looks uh, like a superpower. And, uh, but the main goal here is that, is that you're not chasing uh, like the next hot programming language, or you're not uh, changing technology just for the sake, let's try out this uh, uh, shiny database as it uh, says it solves my use case. Uh, so I've touched it earlier, but uh, on the back end, it's really important to write the right tooling for you um, based on the access patterns, which, uh, the example that I gave, if you need in-memory database or relational one. All right. Um, yeah, but we really are talking today about micro -fronts. So what if you really want to try out this style and you think uh, it just uh, will help, will improve dramatically what are you doing today? So let's look at the four key areas and how you would uh, think through them and what to do for each step. And then we will see by doing so what type of cost you would have to pay for each. So team autonomy. Um, so the first thing, uh, if you want to embrace microphones, you need to look around and see how many teams are working with you today. So for example, if you have a single backend team and your front end team, there is no much space to, to adopt this style, right? Because uh, you need at least a couple of teams working on the same project and then um, maybe you want to solve some inter-team dependencies issues that you are encountering over and over where one team is really slowing you down. So these two um, indicators are uh, like advocating for trying it out. But if you don't really have inter, if you have multiple teams working in the same repo and it's not really causing any issues, um, maybe the price you would pay by adopting microfinance is too high for you. Uh, it, you should all also think about if the clear split uh, in the front end is possible, right? Um, so you need to, uh, you would basically need to analyze the app and uh, somehow retranslate the UI for it into business features and then see if we can group them somehow that they are really interdependent and none of them will require our teams to synchronize or approve each other work. So if that's possible, you're always good to go. And uh, the other one is, if you feel that you need to deliver something faster. So for example, you were in situations where you had this feature ready on the front end, but you, you just couldn't deliver as the release was held off by other teams saying we are not ready or they had some functionality, had to feature flag functionality, hide it just for you to go and deliver your feature. So this definitely indicates that microfinance would be beneficial if you experience this. Um, yeah, but team, Teams autonomy doesn't come for free. Let me move this one. Uh, yeah, once you have more Teams, uh, it um, would definitely increase communication a uh, lot on the organization and would add some management overhead as uh, usually you would want to add a team lead for each team, you might want to add a scrum master or product owner. So this recomposition would cost you some organizational efforts there. Also, when you are extracting new domains or you're splitting some, one app that has its own product lead, suddenly you need multiple product leads as otherwise you won't really have independent teams that could go uh, fast enough. So then you are about to hire or convert somebody to a new product owner. Um, yeah, also a, autonomy means that some teams would introduce code duplication. As you can th think about this, uh, 
all of the teams will write front end apps deployed to production. So all of them would eventually import uh, at least front end framework there of their choice. And it will and uh, it would be duplicated on the user end. Uh, and the last one, you, in some cases, you might not be benefiting anymore from shared reviews. And uh, this is not always the case in the multi-team setup, but uh, sometimes if you work with um, bright engineers, having more opinions on the change is more beneficial and it just helps to, uh, to write a better code. So in this case, as you are an independent team, the outside reviews won't be norm anymore. All right, the next one, uh, deploy independency. Um, so it's really important to, um, to think about your front end, your part of the front end as a standalone app. So you cannot really uh, write uh, the piece of front end and uh, just wrap it to a package that you publish to NPM and then let somebody install it into their project, into a bigger project and uh, build it for you. You would have to deploy it to production either as a script or at the full featured app and um, somehow track that nobody is doing this build time integrations, which are making your team dependent on the other team. Uh, this also means this type of independency forces you in uh, to use in separate repos as it just gives you more flexibility and you can establish your uh, deploy pipelines uh, separately from others. But um, I think there are also examples of uh, companies using monorepo setup and that's what we are we might want to try too, where all projects are collocated in the same repo, uh, but still are maintained by different teams. But I think personally, I think ideally you would want to use a separate repos for each team. Yeah, and uh, the deploying dependency definitely contributes and unlocks your faster delivery as each team deploys this change to website independently. Um, yeah, costs for this are not really crazy, but you can you should think that you definitely have more infrastructure to manage. So you you need to create more repos. And um, I have an example from our project. So recently we ran out of GitHub seats, so we have newcomers waiting for. GitHub access for weeks, as at this point, we just need to renegotiate a contract with GitHub. So that's a thing to keep in mind when you are working with micro finance or you are converting something that's already established. So now your team would have to manage or somehow ask it's an infrastructure team to create build jobs for them, as well as you might think that you might want to track releases in Jira independently if you are releasing through Jira, uh, definitely. But basically you, you also need um, separate deploy tools and tracking tools for this. Um, deploying to prod, even if that's a form of a script or a standalone app, you at this point you have something running in production which affects your users. So you need more to build more monitoring around these apps now. So you need some systems letting you know that this website just went down or this is not available. So in case of a single app, most of the time, such monitoring tools are trivial. Uh, you would just write a test that goes to the website, logs in, maybe checks that the app is not empty, the main page is not empty. And you would just need to redo the same thing for, for independently deployed apps, or if you are deploying a script to figure out some new approach to do so. And uh, the last one, um, it's not really a big concern, but um, from my experience, um, uh, sometimes automation engineers would like to run apps locally if there is no um, 
other automated way to, to, to create a test build or preview version of the website. So uh, by stepping into this independently deployed apps, you might actually see people and trying to run all of your apps on the same machine at the same time. So at this point, you, you might want to think about problems like, are we using same ports for all of the websites and things like that. And uh, as well as in performance of the workstation of this engineer who's trying to do so. All right, uh, technology, free technology choices. So this one is to help teams to be independent. And uh, as I've covered earlier, it's not really about being different or trying something that uh, you wanted to try just for the sake of trying. And uh, I think personally, I think it's not that critical compared to backend work where technology might save you and save you lots of time in development or improve uh, performance of your service. Here, technology, I think front end technologies are more or less at the same level today as, um, as we have it. Uh, so the choices you might make here is that, for example, my, my team would really like to embrace TypeScript as we think is the future, but somebody other would say that we, we're still writing in React class components as that's the best uh, knowledge we have today and we are moving faster with it instead of redoing something else. So this is now totally possible and not impacted by anyone from the outside. Uh, another benefit from it is that, for example, if you want to experiment with something and you are owning your own sub portion of the app in a standalone repo with your own tooling, now you are actually free to change uh, libraries, change approaches and deploy independently or even deploy and hide it or deploy two different versions of the same feature as you're not really locked in uh, into others or you don't need to communicate this change to everyone. And uh, the last one is a minor one. Um, so you are also unlocked to do library and tooling upgrades in isolation. And the trivial example I have for today is that situations where I've been into, like for example, if you update linter just because of the, some of the features is not supported on this version. So you have to go one version up and suddenly, suddenly you have to change huge amount of files from all across the app. And at this point, instead of doing your, the feature you were planning to do, you have to double check regress or find people who knows how to recheck all of the other parts of the app you've just updated by fixing links. Um, the costs here are not crazy too. Um, and the first one, uh, it really depends on the company ideas. Uh, so some companies uh, would actually support and promote internal rotation where you could go from team to team and without leaving the company, even without changing roles. Uh, so enabling technolo different technologies in different teams would just um, require these devs to, to have a longer ramp up time but it's not really a hard stop there and uh, also from my experience having this mix of technology uh, is slowing down or uh, making your hiring process a bit clunky as once you present uh, somebody with what your project is doing you suddenly have to step through lots and lots of uh, libraries and uh, explain why <laughs> why there is a mix like you could just imagine me explaining in the interview why there is an angular js app that now has half of it rewritten in react for no good reason right and um, 
things like that. So definitely not, um, it definitely has some cost there. Right, the last one, no shared runtime. Uh, this one is pretty important. So uh, by embracing a micro formats, you would have to work with teams to, to make them think about their apps as independent pieces. Um, and uh, common things that we usually do, so typically we think about front end app. Um, so let's just take an uh, example of a Redux architecture. You would think I have an app, I have a global state, I could subscribe to it, right? Uh, I always synchronize any UI updates with the state and each component, every component has access to the uh, exact uh, state of the app, uh, data of this app at any given point in time. So with microfinance, this is no longer the case as your app has to work built and uh, be tested independently. So you would end up storing this uh, sub app state scoped here. Um, and this means that you might end up with multiple stores or multiple data, data basically scattered in the final app and hidden from each other by these sub apps. Um, so at this point, if you need them to synchronize or talk to each other, uh, one of the most natural choices here would be messaging. So you could either set up um, some eventing mechanism in the that browser provides us by default, or somehow connect them through the main shell app that collects all of the sub apps into some greater experience together. So this this could be like in the form of orchestrator that connects and subscribes them via callbacks or events, which is more convenient. Yeah, and this greater app also now responsible uh, in doing some common things like user authentication, checking for if you are entitled to do some actions, all of the typical things that we, are, we were doing in some main component and then filling up uh, our store with the state if this user is in a good shape. So now you have to, this is all moved up, moved one level up and is the, Suggestion uh, in the most of the sources is that you just pass in this from the parent container. Um, cost for no shared runtime. Um, so despite being separate websites, we, in the end, in the final build, they all will run in the shared space. And um, so at this point, you would have to establish conventions or provide tooling for your code to be namespaced. So it's either could be team prefixes or some other approach, maybe uh, like hashing your names, but you, you could definitely uh, mess up a global um, things like um, you could add a global style that interacts uh, with the entire app or as you don't really see how the whole app operates when you are developing and writing to some browser storage, you just you just had no idea the same approach was taken by some other team. And this key in the storage is already taken. So now you need somehow to protect yourself from this integration um, errors, which you might achieve with the writing functional tests or by making this, um, namespacing and prefixing a part of your build chain, build step. Um, yeah, and uh, if you are following the idea of parent container that does uh, common things for you, you're now suddenly need to have a dummy one if you need to run this app locally and uh, make requests to the backend for authenticated users. So, each team would have to write their own like simpler implementation of, to achieve this and to simulate the final, final initialization step. And the same idea 
as the previous slide is that some people would actually try to run all of your apps on their machine and might reach out to you asking questions why something conflicts with each other. Um, all right, so having these four <clears throat> ideas in place, uh, you also need to think that um, it's totally fine to have some code duplication and just for the sake of uh, keeping teams independent. And uh, you shouldn't be looking for ways to optimize <clears throat> bundles, bundling and uh, code size, but there are some techniques that are available today to do so. But in general, I think that's also a counterintuitive idea is that you shouldn't be solving this right away. Uh, yeah, also for an average for a <laughs> for an average developer, uh, experience uh, with this app might be less convenient when you understand that uh, you are limited with some um, techniques you already know. But I guess it's also like a smaller cost here and uh, could be solved just by ramping up with the project. And um, if your company has an approach of uh, establishing coding standards or just like we do, making some tool a default choice for everyone, then with the microfinance and multiple teams, this uh, won't be easy to implement and might be also um, hard in this whole idea uh, in general. And uh, you could uh, easily see how different teams would just establish their own team practices, their own styles. And if it helps them to move faster, it's totally fine. But if you are looking for some coding standards, you would now have to talk to five teams, for example, and just get buy-in from everyone that let's apply this pattern or let's use this moving forward. All right, um, so going to the conclusion and um, so we definitely have microfinance on uh, our roadmap and uh, we sort of uh, have problems that microfinance could help us to solve as we have uh, multiple teams already we have clear split of uh, application to domains that could be uh, independent. We already see interdependencies um, where one team is blocking other team uh, with uh, release to prod. So it definitely looks like a clear choice to try. And um, at least my team, we won't really go into this land right away, at least not this year. But uh, not to end on the pessimistic note for this talk, uh, we do have a new project coming up next year, which is developing games for students. Um, so basically in addition to doing lessons in the browser, you would now be able to play a game that's also has some activities to build, to help you with learning this subject. And this project is uh, uh, set up. You can see how it's built around. We already know that we would have uh, a big amount of games uh, that we want to develop in parallel. It's already scheduled to, uh, it's already defined to have multiple teams starting up. Uh, at least as of now, we're claiming seven plus teams to start from sprint one. And uh, this specific one really shines here that uh, there is no really cross domain concerns as each game discovers some small uh, task or small problem and none of them should be really interacting with each other. So if you think about this type of project um, with the uh, single front end repo and the way we, we do projects today, you could easily see how uh, you would struggle through a couple of first sprints. And uh, we already had uh, something similar, but uh, with less content, uh, maybe seven or five years ago. Uh, so what happened there is that one team became uh, pretty vocal and more dominant than the others. And they claim, so they were 
maintaining their own feature as well as enforcing a core core functionality for the entire app. So what was happening there is that this team would eventually rewrite and change the core based on their use cases and then just forcing out everyone to go through indefinite rewrites for their domains every like next sprint. So it ended up pretty, I mean, the project was definitely delivered, <laughs> but it wasn't the best uh, developer experience to work in this setup. So the expectations for this uh, project is that investing in micro frontends, basically paying this price of more setting up more jobs, repositories totally sacrificing the idea of a single code base and um, making this app totally independent of each other. Uh, for this number of teams and uh, games looks pretty reasonable. So we are looking forward to see how it pays out for this one next year. All right, so that's it for today from me. We could go through questions if there are some. <laughs>